first hurdle is the four percent under conditionality and after that then if the, if you can get over seven percent that will tick the box for one eco scheme and if you can get over 10 percent space for nature that will tick the box for the second eco scheme the number of base application forms submitted to the Department of Agriculture is broadly on track with other years, considering the number of days to the closing of the scheme. The scheme online application process has a familiar feel, but there are more areas which need to be checked by the farmer or advisor to ensure compliance. Areas such as space for nature, eco schemes, protein schemes, straw incorporation schemes, etc. all need to be correct to ensure trouble-free payment. You were listening to the latest episode of The Tillage Edge with me, Michael Hennessy. We would really appreciate it if you could listen, follow and give us a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast from. I'm joined today by John Brophy, a Chagas advisor in NACE, to discuss the new BIS application and how farmers can better prepare for the visit to complete this form. John, there's a lot of areas where a farmer can prepare in advance of their appointment with you to complete that BIS application. The system of transferring entitlements has changed a little bit over the years. But firstly, it's always good to know how much these entitlements are worth. How can the farmer find out the value of these entitlements? Value of entitlements can be found online. Um, they're going to be there under My Correspondence, or they're also going to be there under the My Entitlement Value tab. And they can look at the entitlements for value for the next couple of years. And they'll also be able to look at maybe why entitlements maybe they have leased in also or maybe leased out. Okay, but I suppose in for that, the, uh, the farmer needs to be online and needs to get set up and have the passwords and all that kind of stuff. Did did the um, farmers or did, did, did the department send out a statement of those entitlements, what they might be worth at any stage, do you think? Um, no, not that I'm aware of. I think a text would have went out to the farmer to say there was correspondence there. Now, those entitlements, I suppose, if, if, if you do have an advisor and you're going into an advisor, you can get those entitlement values from the advisor and he could email, maybe email out that... Um, entitlement value form that's there online under my correspondence. Okay. But of course, the, the values that come up for this, the entitlements that you can see online, that's not the total value of what you can claim by claiming those entitlements. There's other schemes there called Chris and Eco Scheme. Uh, what sort of payments would be attached to those? Uh, well, the Chris scheme is, a, is, is basically a top-up scheme for the first 30 hectares and the payment on that is probably around 43 euro a hectare. And the eco scheme then is separate again. And the payment on the eco scheme is roughly maybe around 65 euro per hectare. We don't fully know yet until the end of the year till all the applications have gone in. Okay, but on Chris, it, there's there's very little to do with it from a farmer's point of view. You just need to have the land. Uh, but the eco scheme is slightly different. There's a few things that, that, that need to be done, which we, which we'll make, we might come back to that in, in, in a few minutes. But there's a few elements to that, I think. I just might maybe just may, may, maybe work mentioned there maybe further, Chris. As far as I'm aware, you need to have at least one entitlement already in your name to get Chris payment. So it's just okay. maybe if there is or one or two farmers out there that maybe have no entitlements at all, that have to just look at that aspect just to get that Chris payment. Okay. So if we just maybe throw an example to you, and this probably I'm sure this probably happens quite often. Uh, where a farmer is calling into you and he sits down and he says to you that, uh, look, I'm renting out some land and I'm also renting out these entitlements. You know, how do, can can you help me with this process? Uh, and and is that process different, I suppose, this year, John, than it would have been in the past? Um, no, it's, it's similar to maybe what's in the past. I suppose the first thing maybe is for the farmer when he comes in is maybe to have his homework done, go through his maps and go through the crops and go through the white page that come in the post. So they would have got in the post, they would have got the maps and a white page with the plot numbers and last year's crop. So they can go through that and look at the look at the crops and mark them in and also mark off then which which parcels maybe that they're leasing out. They at least they know when to come in, which parcels are going to be gone and they know how many hectares it is. So when, when they come in to me then, you know, we'd, we'd probably would go through the application first and see where they are at the end on land versus entitlements. And those extra entitlements then can be leased out. Um, I suppose there's a couple of ways of going about leasing those entitlements then at that stage. Um, do you mean if a farmer is leasing directly to another farmer, that can that can be done. Um, I suppose what what you need to do then is that the, those are transferred. So you'll need the farmer's name that you're leasing them to and his herd number. The farmer's name needs to be the farmer's name that's on the far, that farmer's BIS application. So we can put that into the computer and create and create a form then to transfer transfer those entitlements, whether it be through maybe a lease or a sale or a gift. 
And that farm then was generated. Then the farmer needs to go away then with that farm and have that farm witnessed by either a guard, a peace commissioner, commissioner of votes, or a solicitor and bring that farm back then to us. But he needs to make sure then that the farm is fully signed by whoever's witnessed it and is also stamped and dated. So that's a new step, John, is it? That's a new step from last year, yeah. Up to now, we could witness those farms, but from now on, those farms for, for a direct transfer to a farmer, we can't witness them anymore. It has to be, as I said, the, the mentioned ones already. So it does take an extra bit of time then in terms of, of, of getting an application form done if there's entitlements being leased in or leased out. Exactly. Well, it's for, yeah, for leasing out, that's going to be the process. When the farmer comes back, then it, we can generate a code and we can give that fo- code to the farmer that can be passed on then to the other farmer that's leasing in the entitlements. And for the farmer then that's maybe on the other side that's leasing in the in- leasing in the entitlements, he just needs the code to come from the farmer leasing them out and he puts in the code to accept in the entitlements. Okay. And is that different, that process any different if there's an auctioneer in the middle of that process? That would be, yeah, the process for an auctioneer is different. I suppose if you're leasing them out, um, we have to go in and set up the auctioneer as a facilitator. And that form has to be signed by the farmer also, but that form can be witnessed by yourselves and uploaded. And we put in onto the, onto, onto the sheet and onto, onto the system then how many entitlements are being leased in or leased out. And once, once that's up then, the facilitator then can progress with leasing the entitlements. But the farmer needs to go back to the facilitator and let them know that the process is that process is done, that he can lease the entitlements. He also needs to go to the to the um to the facilitator also, which generally is an auctioneer, with the values of his entitlements for the year or maybe for the next four or five years. Okay. So look what I'm what I'm hearing here is that it's quite complex type scenario. Uh, there's a good bit of coming and going and there's generations of numbers and numbers to be passed uh, between different people and there's witnesses to be to be, um, you know, uh, visited to sign some of this stuff as well. So there's a good few steps within this. So would it be reasonable to say then that that, that uh, farmers that are leasing out uh, or leasing out or leasing in any entitlements to contact their advisor as quickly as they can and don't leave it to the last minute? Yes, Michael, it would be at this stage because I know as we get near the, the closing date, it's going to be a lot harder for uh, an auctioneer to lease out or sell entitlements. So John, we might just move on a little bit. We, we, we mentioned a little bit about uh, Space for Nature uh, a few minutes ago, or sorry, the EFAs, but, uh, uh, we mentioned, uh, and they intersect with the likes for, of Space for Nature. There is requirements there um, uh, for Space for Nature, and they're replacing the, the old EFAs, I suppose, maybe in the past. Farmers have a minimum requirement of 4%, which I presume that nearly all farmers are pretty much able to get to. But what sort of percentage, in a general sense, uh, are the departments saying that uh, tillage farmers have in terms of space for nature? I suppose the farmers, I wouldn't say that maybe the department are saying it, but just looking at maybe applications I, I've been putting in so far, tillage farmers are probably in around the 8% mark, maybe on average. Maybe some can go over the 10%, but generally 8% is what I am seeing. Okay, so, mo- so pretty much all of them are able to jump over that minimum 4% that there's no choice but to, but to get over that. Yeah, that's that's correct. Like for the majority, maybe when I do go in onto the application, some can fall below that 4%. But like once we go into the fields and look for hedges or, or, or streams or that, we can map them in, and that will bring them over the 4%, yeah. Okay. And then we mentioned this eco scheme and that intersects with this space for nature. Uh, and with the eco scheme, every farmer needs to uh, get at least two or tick out uh, two options within these eco schemes and there's about seven or eight different options within that um when we look at the space for nature element of it where most uh, get over is four percent what is the criteria for the space for nature for the eco schemes what is there different percentages in that yeah correct michael so i suppose yeah the first hurdle is the four percent under conditionality and after that then if, the, if you can get over seven percent that will tick the box for one eco scheme and if you can get over 10% space for nature, that will tick the box for the second eco scheme. So if you can get over 10%, that's your two eco scheme boxes ticked and you don't have to worry about any other actions. If you get over maybe the 7% and can't get over the 10%, you'll have to look at, I know at least what, you'll have to look at one other option then of the list of eight to get yourself in um, over the line for the eco schemes. 
Okay, and from the point of view, if if if, if a, a grower came in to you, chatting to you, and you looked at the space for nature on the farm, and it was about seven point one or seven point two percent, would you be happy enough to to proceed to say that that's one eco scheme, or would you? Is it a bit too tight? Put it that way. I think that's too tight. I'd go through the maps to see maybe is there hedges there that's map not marked in correctly. And there's also maybe just double check maybe on a few fields that maybe look high in the figures just in case maybe that the, the figures are maybe a little bit high that they're double accounting where maybe I have seen issues where maybe a hedge is marked in twice or maybe marked in as an external hedge but maybe it's not it's a, it's just a hedge a boundary hedge with a neighbouring farmer Okay and and within that space for nature then um, it, it, it includes hedges and ditches and dikes or grapes or whatever you might like to call them but all that kind of stuff is there any pre-work a farmer can do if a farmer thinks they're a little bit on the borderline, if you like? Yeah, well, I suppose he can sit down and look at his maps and maybe just go around the fields on the maps and just look and see where there is hedges and maybe mark them in, you mean, and, and maybe just keep an eye maybe where there is a, areas of hedge, hedge and marked, maybe on, the, on some of the maps the hedges are marked, just to keep an eye that maybe they're marked correctly. But definitely mark in the hedges as you go around the fields makes the thing a lot easier for the advisor then once he's in because the farmer can look and he'll know straight away rather than trying to think then is there a hedge there or not okay there's also maybe other options there as well maybe if there's areas of scrub or maybe there's a bit of a field maybe that was taken out maybe a number of years ago because because of over claims that maybe they could look at maybe adding that back in now at this stage and then if a farmer doesn't get uh, any fur no he gets seven percent he's one but he needs the farmer needs to make up uh, another uh, eco scheme measure. What's the most popular ones that uh, most of the tillage farmers are actually looking at? I suppose the the next popular one there is the break crop option. So if you have more than fifty percent tillage and you have a break crop of oats and um, seed rape or beans, and that's over twenty percent, that's a break crop option that you could also pick. Okay, that's a pretty straightforward one, okay. And what about the, is there a GPS one there as well? So the G, that's the next one then as well, is the GPS one. So if you have GPS spreading of fertilizer or spraying, you can use that option. Now, everything has to be done with that machine if you pick it. So if, if you pick the GPS option for spreading the fertilizer, all spread, fertilizer must be spread, and the same with the sprayer. And it's, it's, it's full GPS, so it's full section control of the machines. So the machines have to be able to turn on and off themselves through the GPS it's not a case of just having a GPS in the cab of the tractor and nothing on the machine. It's, it's, it's full GPS control. Okay. Uh, is there any criteria in terms of filling up the forms that, that, that the, the farmer should be aware of to bring into you as an advisor filling up those forms for, for that criteria? Yeah, the system looks, if, if you're putting it in as, a, as your own machine, the system is looking for the, the make, the model, and optional is then also the serial number of the machine. And if, if if they're not doing it that way, that they're maybe getting in a contract, of which I'm seeing in some cases, you'd need the details of the contractor, just the name of the contractor to put down as the contractor. Okay. Unit. Just the name of the contractor? Just the name of the contractor at the minute, yeah. Now, they probably, they will look for proof maybe at some other point that the contractor has GPS. And I suppose you, you want to just make sure that any invoices coming from the contractor states that the spraying or spreading was done by a GPS machine. I hear, John, there's, there's farmers, certainly with the year that's in it, and they have maybe switched cropping uh, a little bit, uh, might have maybe dropped oats, which could have counted in that break crop scenario and maybe they're back into, um, you know, planting some some spring barley. Is, is there any, is there a criteria within any of those uh, where um, the reduced fertilizer one option within the eco scheme would suit? I've looked at that, Michael, and the reduced fertilizer option is there. I think it's 139 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, which creates to around probably around 110 units of nitrogen per hectare. Per acre. Per acre, sorry, yeah. And, and that leaves things very tight for a farmer, especially if you have winter crops on the farm. If it's just spring crops, fair enough. But if it's uh, winter crops, it's going to leave things very tight. And especially maybe with the department looking at tracking fertilizer, it's an option maybe I'd be just very careful of picking from that point of view, especially if, if you are buying a good bit of fertilizer to grow your crops. Okay, okay. Well, that's, that's, that's good advice. So in terms of the other preparation that, that, that a farmer might do, and again, you'd often see a little bit of this where farmers subdivide fields. Is there anything that a farmer can or should have to hand in terms of coming into you with these, you know, to, to make sure those subdivisions are quite are right? Yeah, I suppose have the field measured or know where the subdivision in the field is. 
sometimes maybe when you look at the map it's simple enough you can see a line there previously from the previous crops and you can see the subdivision but other times then maybe it's not that obvious because the lines there are completely different especially maybe where a farmer maybe subdividing to put in um, beans I mean it, it, it could be changing around across the field so he needs to know exactly where that subdivision is going and put and the measurement in the area of the field um, when you talk about beans uh, how accurate does that area need to be for the likes of beans or maybe even a strong corporation area I think for the beans, Michael, it has to be very accurate because the, the eye in the sky is is checking this and basically it's checking, it's not checking what it can see, it's the colours that has been reported back on, on a weekly basis and it's able to measure then over time which crop is there. It's the same as yourself and yourself looking at a map every week and seeing the colour change. You kind of get an idea, well, look, that's beans or that's barley from the time and of it. So this machine is able to do it automatically and it can pick it out and it, it's going to be very, very accurate. Okay, so so a farmer shouldn't be coming into you and kind of saying, "Oh, I think it's it's near enough at that drain there somewhere." It probably needs to be a bit more accurate exactly. than that. Needs yeah. to be a specific spot. Okay, and and what about um, you know farmers again coming in where they might have put in a new roadway into the side of a field? How is that dealt with now? Yeah, that needs to be taken out now. So it also needs to be marked in. Previously, sometimes we might just reduce the claimed area of the field, but now the department are looking for that marked in and taken out so if the farmer needs to identify where the, the laneway is and maybe the length and the width of the laneway kind of get a rough idea for the advisor to draw it in so the advisor will draw it in as an exclusion area and mark it down as, as a, maybe a roadway or maybe if it's a building or a site do the same mark it down as that and it also reduce the claimed area of the field then by by that amount so it is important that that is marked in on on the maps now and, and that would be something similar to say a, a son or a daughter or some or maybe selling a site there's a site coming off a particular field. It's a similar kind of process. Similar process there, exactly. Yeah, the site needs to be marked in as an excluded area and reduced then from the claimed area. So the department are now looking for those sites to be actually drawn in onto the onto the maps. So, John, in, in kind of an ideal world then, a farmer coming in to you then should have maybe ideally a, a, an old set of maps with the all of the crops written in on, on it and... The uh, LPIS numbers, I think you mentioned those to make sure that they have those for, for, for land that's coming in. Is, is that all, you know, is that all kind of almost, for you, from your point of view, almost a prerequisite that everyone should have that done and it'll make the whole thing work that much easier? That's correct, Michael. Yes, they should should have that done. Like The, the maps and last year crops were sent out in the post oil farmer, so they would have that there. So it's a matter of taking out the farm maybe in the night or two nights before you come in and looking through it and just writing down which crops is in each parcel. At least it makes the thing quicker then when they come in to me. I mean, because it, the process can get very slow when a farmer arrives in with the envelope and it's possibly not even opened. And then they have to try and remember what's in each field. Whereas if they have that done, it just makes the process a lot quicker because there is a number of things to get through in, in the appointment in a short space of time. And, and of course, then, not to add to your woes, but obviously you know it's there, but there, there, there's acres as well. Many A lot of farmers are after entering acres. What sort of checks do you need to, to, to have on those with that BIS play, uh, application? Well, it depends on the acres application, but I suppose maybe for tillage farmers, the two options really that that we need to definitely know that because they're rotational options, you can rotate them around the farm, is going to be catch crops and uh, mintail. So those are marked in onto the system then. So you, you, you pick your plots where you're doing your catch crops and your mintail at this stage on the BPS application. So the farmer needs to have an idea about, right, I'm going to put my catch crops and mintail in these fields so we can mark those down. That's the ones that will have to put them in later on in the year. Exactly, yeah. So John, you mentioned mintail there as well, but what about straw chopping? Should farmers have an idea what fields the, they're going to chop later on in the, in the year? Uh, yes, Michael, they, they should. I, I find sometimes um, farmers maybe are not sure this when they come in. I mean, so it's ideally they need to know this when they come in to me. It's probably one of the last sections when we're filling out the the, the BP or the BIS farms the straw chopping is there is at nearly nearly at the end so it's just at that stage then we need to tick the box for which parcel that the straw chopping is going to go into and I suppose farmer needs to know just which parcels and which crops he's going to chop so he's going to tra- chop the cereals and he's going to chop oilseed rape and um, and the oats and um, the spring beans is not or, or winter beans even aren't available for chopping Okay, and maybe the last one I'm going to leave it leave, leave it in this one. Maybe we should have started on this one. Started first on this one. I'm not sure, um. But there is, I suppose, a number of um herd number 
uh, name changes, uh, either from fathers to sons or daughters, or maybe into a, a company or a partnership type scenario. How are you dealing with those, or, or is there a different process around that to make sure that's all set up right? Well, I suppose the farmer needs to let the advisor know as soon as possible. Do you mean, in most cases, probably the farmer has been dealing with the advisor in getting those name changes done. In some cases, maybe they have, maybe they have gone through their um, their um, accountant, maybe set up a partnership or adding on a name that just sent it off to DVO, but maybe never mentioned it. So if, if that is the case, they need to let the advisor know straight away for the simple reason. Once a herd number is changed, that has moved to a company or maybe a partnership is created or that name is actually even added to a herd number. The old profile of just a single name, it'll still be on the system, but it's no longer longer active. But the, the advisor won't have access to the new entity in under the new names. So an authorization form needs to be signed and sent away to the department for the advisor to get access to that new entity. So that, that needs to be done first of all before advisor can do a base application. So that needs to be done a couple of days before an actual appointment is made. And also maybe on that then as well, it's just to be aware that entitlements will also have to be moved from the old entity to the new entity, whether it be a lease or, or a, a change of a change of registration or a change of name. And, and that type change, um, John, how long does that take? Could that take two or three days or a week or, or a bit longer? Or how long does it take? Well, it depends on, on the starting point, Michael. I suppose if the change has already been in the DVO, you can get the farms across and take a few days. But if it's a case of the farmers only looking at changing the name now to add the sun, that's going to take a number of days, a number of weeks in the DVO and may not get set up by the deadline. So it's important for, for the farmer to have that conversation with the advisor now, even before he arranges an appointment. Okay, to avoid disappointment. Yeah. John, in fairness, you remind of information and uh, I know you're at this all the time and you have a huge level of work uh, ahead of you over the next uh, two or three weeks. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm going to let you back to it. But look, thanks very much for, for giving us a little bit of your time this morning uh, and hopefully anyone listening to this will be a little bit more set up to visit their advisor uh, to fill out that BIS application. Thanks very much, John. Okay, thanks, Michael. You're welcome. So that's it for this week and my thanks to John for joining me on the show. Finally, don't forget if you enjoyed the podcast then recommend it to a friend or colleague and as always, rate, review and follow on Apple or Spotify so you never miss an episode. And for more information, go to chargis.ie. I'm Michael Hennessy. Thanks for listening and I'll be back next week with more tillage news and advice.